And let's open in prayer. Please pray with me. Our God in heaven, we rejoice today that we have a living Savior uh, who sits on the throne and we worship you and magnify you today and pray, Father, that you would bless our gathering and bless those that are on the way, bless those that are joining us online, help all of us uh, to be able to genuinely participate in the worship of our mighty God, help us to give praise and honor to you that would be pleasing in your sight. Uh, help, uh, help us as we sit under the Word to be fed, edified, and, and Father, even challenged regarding the Gospel for those that need to be born again. And Lord, we ask Your blessing on every aspect of the service today. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Alright, take your hymn books out. Turn to hymn 472. And I'm just getting my hymn book here. 472. My Jesus, oh no, 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 not 472, wrong day, 286, 286, 286, hallelujah, what a Savior, and let's all stand as we open our service with 286. Man of sorrows, what a name For the Son of God who came Ruined sinners to reclaim Hallelujah, what a Savior Bearing shame and scoffing rude In my place condemned he stood Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hymn 286 on verse 3. Guilty, violent, helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. On verse 4, lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. On the last, when he comes, our glorious King. All his ransomed one to bring. Knew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. And I want to welcome you to Bible Baptist Church this morning. It is good to have you here. And I know we don't have any first time visitors right now at least. Uh, so let's go right into the announcements. A couple announcements. Pray for those that are away, uh, which would be uh, many, but especially our song leader and our associate pastor uh, for today. Anyway, um, the men's conference, uh, it is scheduled for November 10th and 11th. That's a Friday and a Saturday. And it's going to be at Chad's Ford Baptist Church in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, which is not that far from here. Uh, we w I'd love to have a good group. We've had some good groups go. Uh, you don't even need to get a motel. Uh, you can just drive. It's so close to here. That's what I'm going to be doing, just going up each day. And uh, if, um, if, if you would want to go, but you don't have the money to pay for the whole thing, we want you to go. Uh, just talk to me. Um, and and we, you know, we want, I want as many people to go as possible. It is a great time. Good singing. Good preaching. It's jam-packed. We meet uh, Friday afternoon, and then we're done by Saturday noon so that everybody can get back in time for church the next day. And uh, we would love to have you go. Um, it's going to be a great time. Then also on uh, Wednesday, October 18th, it's in a few weeks, we're going to have our last quarterly business meeting for the year. Uh, and it's going to be on a Wednesday night. And it's for especially for voting members. We are now doing them online and live which has really helped us to be able to have a, a, a quorum, which used to be a real challenge. Uh, but it, it helps to have that convenience. 
And so that will be on October 18th, the third Wednesday in October. And uh, if you haven't considered church membership, we would love to have you become a member and, and, and have the what, what's called the right of franchise. That is, as a congregationally run church, the pastor doesn't run the church. The pastoral staff doesn't run the church. The deacons don't run the church. We try to provide leadership, but it is a congregationally run church. And, then, and we, we do our voting and stuff uh, at our business meetings. And so uh, we would love for you to be a part of that. Um, let me know if you're interested in that. And then uh, the, the, our, last, or our, yeah, our last of the year, Soup and Chili Fellowship panel discussion is going to be October 29th. Uh, that'll be our last one for the year. I am so blessed by them already. Uh, so mark it down Sunday, October 29th. And because of the weather, this is really going to be a soup and chili fellowship. So, Mike, you can make it as hot as you possibly want. No, he's saying no. He tones it down. Uh, I actually like the hot stuff. So that's going to be on that day. And then we already have discussion. We have three topics already that folks have submitted for the last one. But if you have an idea of what you would like the, the panel to discuss and, and the, you know, to deal with this, uh, let us know. Let m myself, Mr. Noble, one of the deacons, you let us know and we'll put it on the docket. If we don't get to it this, this October, we'll get to it the next one. And we love, uh, it was such a blessing to be able to talk about things that are on your mind. Um, so, so see me after if, that's interest, if you're interested. Okay, at this time we're going to uh, receive our offering. We'll have the men come. Men, you can come now. And I'm going to have tell Allah come to the pulpit and pray for the offering. Okay, before you do it, brother. Thank you. Um, it's a great morning. It's uh, rainy out there, but we thank you for the people that have showed up. We praise you for this day. Please uh, help us in uh, serving you and then doing what we're supposed to do with what we give, Father, from what you have given us. It's all yours. Guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. Thank you for that light and fluffy song, Jane. Anybody know the title of that song? And I, we need, we need that, that kind of lighthearted, fun song on a rainy, dark day. It was perfect. Anybody know the name of that? I'm um, saved, saved, saved. Right, Jane? What's that? That's the last line anyway. 
Okay, well, that's what I'm thinking of. But and I love that. I'm saved, saved, saved. I don't know what the... Do you know what the name of it is, Jane? Uh, I don't, a lot of them, the titles are different in the hymn That is true. A lot of them are different. Very good point, Jane. But I hope that you are saved, saved, saved. By New Life Divine, that kind of... Awesome. All right, let's open our Bibles today for our scripture reading. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 1. Again, thank you for joining us. Some of you fill in, filling in the bare spots there. And uh, we are looking at Philippians chapter 1. And today, uh, we're going to read beginning in verse 12 through verse 18. So let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, down through verse 18. Please follow along as I read. Paul says, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. May God bless His word to us today. Let's bow in prayer. Our God, thank you again for meeting our needs. Your word says, where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And Father, we pray as born-again believers are gathered together in various places all over our country, that we would magnify you, that you would be lifted up and exalted, that your word would be preached in truth. And Father, we pray that you would help us today to do that in this place. Many, many years ago, Lord, you spoke to the believers in Philippi through this letter that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And I pray today that you would help us to properly interpret the Scriptures so we understand what Paul was talking about and then how that would apply to us so that we might also, Father, make sure that we are embracing the true gospel and then that we might rejoice when that gospel is heralded in the world. And we ask your blessing today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. And we want to open our hymn books now to hymn 564, Count Your Blessings, 564. All three verses. When you are de- you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, 
Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. On the last. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journeys and Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Amen. Need help, Jane? You okay? Thank you. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Thanks for being here today. Is it, is it pretty miserable out still? Not too bad. Is it raining right now? When, oh, it's not. Okay. When you came in, <laughs> when you came in, Lana, it was raining. When Serena came in, it was not. Anyway, we're glad that you're here today. Hopefully, we'll bring some sunshine to you. As we open God's Word and, and worship uh, uh, the Son and, and worship Jesus Christ. Not the Son is in the, the, uh, the globe Son, but our Savior. We are going through the book of Philippians, which was an identifying uh, people from a town called Philippi. If you, were, uh, if you lived in the town of Philippi, you were a Philippian. Uh, but this was not addressed to all Philippians. This was addressed to Philippians that were saints, Christians, and, uh, and that's who he was writing to, brethren. That's, that's men and women who have believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Paul uh, had been there uh, prior to writing this letter, about 11 years before. He was on a second missionary journey, and he went, uh, he, he listened to what was called the Macedonian call. And that led him to go over to Europe. And the very first place that he went in Europe was Philippi, where he met a, a, a group of women by the river, worshiping. Lydia was one of the first European converts. And, uh, and then we saw a, a young lady who was a, a soothsayer, who was obviously making people a lot of money. Uh, she got saved. And then uh, the Philippian jailer got saved and a whole bunch of people got saved and a church was started. Now it's 11 years later. Paul is writing to them. His circumstances had changed. For many years, Paul's desire was to get to Rome. Uh, to, to, he, had not, he did not plant the church in Rome like he did the, the, the church in Philippi. Uh, it was, you know, the gospel was preached there. People got saved. And, uh, and Paul, as the apostle, would write to the, to the Gentile, he would write to them, but he had never had the chance to go there. And he communicated. In Romans chapter 1, and then in the last chapter of Romans, he communicated to them how so much he wanted to be there and see them, and now he's there. Not exactly the circumstances he's wanted, because he's in prison, but he's still in Rome. And... Um, and so now he's writing this letter to, from Rome while under house arrest to the Philippians. And so we already looked at the salutation, verses 1 through 11. And what our text today is verses 15 through 18. But in order to understand it, we've got to go back to our text from last week. If you remember, uh, the title of the message last Sunday was uh, un, not unfortunate, Circum, um, unfavorable unfavorable events that's what it was called because Paul said if you look at verse uh, verse 12 he said I would you should understand brethren that the things which happened unto me i.e. his imprisonment bad things hard things he said these things that, you, that have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. It's like, wow, what a strange turn of events. Something really bad happened to me. But he says, but I want you to know that, wow, 
unintended consequences, things turned out, it, it has fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. In verse 13, he says, so that, he's like, listen to this. Look what God did. He said, so that my bonds, that is uh, his imprisonment, his chains, my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. That's a good thing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But then in verse 14 he says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That, so clearly the word of God is going forth in great power. And a lot of that happened because Paul ended up in prison. And then he, but now he says this. In, in other words, this is like the caveat to last Sunday. He's basically sharing good news. Like, look what came out of bad things. But then he's putting us back to earth. And he's saying, now listen, I, I don't want you to think that, you know, as long as you just think everything's going to turn out rosy and there's no problems, he, he's not saying that. He is rejoicing that the gospel is going forth in a bigger way because he ended up going to prison. But it wasn't all roses. In other words, and then he goes on, he says, about these pre people, you know, the brethren are more bold to preach the gospel. So the gospel is going out. But then he says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Is there a version of Jesus Christ that is envious and strife filled? preach Christ of envy and strife? What does he mean by that? He's not talking about that there's two versions of Jesus Christ. He's talking about those people that are preaching the gospel, that the word of God is being spread, and he's rejoicing at that. But he's, he's now saying, not everyone that is going forth and preaching the gospel because of my imprisonment has wonderful motives. In other words, my imprisonment has benefited Christians in two different ways. There are some people that because I am now in chains are taking advantage of it and to spite me, they are going forth and preaching the gospel because it's going to add, make things harder for me. Their motives are not sincere. That's what he means when he says in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. So of those people that are going out and witnessing, not all of them have sincere motives. Some of the people that were preaching the gospel in this century, 61 AD or around that time, some of them were only doing it for one reason. And it was not so that people would get saved. It was to make things hard on the Apostle Paul. They had ulterior motives. And it was strife and envy. How could that happen? We'll talk about that. And then there's the other group in verse 15. The end of verse 15. And some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention. Now he's explaining. What, what are we talking about these two groups? Well, the one... The one that are doing it of envy and strife. Verse 16, they are preaching Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. We're going to talk about that in a minute. What exactly was going on that these people would be emboldened to preach the gospel just to make things harder on Paul? And there was. But then there was the other group, and they were the, you know, they were the good ones. Verse 17, but the other of love. This is the one of the people that were of good will, mentioned in verse 15. Verse 17, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So you have two different kinds of people preaching the gospel. Some of them were not sincere. So the title of the message is, we're going to be talking about them, because that's the issue, is... Gospel insincerity. What, how could somebody preach a message 
that is the gospel, and yet they're not sincere. They're doing it of strife and envy. And then there's other people that have the right motives. Well, let's first, we're going to do three things today. First, what is the right message? What are they talking about? The gospel, the word. What is this message that has been promoted and is now spreading abroad in the whole palace and, and, and other, other places? What is this? Then we're going to see the right message, but the wrong motives. And then the last one, we're going to look at verse 18, and what really mattered to Paul. And it wasn't that there were people that intended him ill will. That was not a big deal to him, per se. He was just so glad that the gospel was going forth, no matter why it was going forth. So let's jump in, and let's first talk about this. Look at, go back to verse 12. Again, Paul said, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The word gospel, it is a Greek word, euangelios, it's where we get the word evangel, evangelistic, evangelical, that's where that word comes from. Literally, it means good news. So, whatever has happened to Paul, his chains, his getting imprisoned, has brought a furtherance of the message that Paul preached. Look at verse 13. So that in my bonds in Christ, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren, verse 14, many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds, so they're inspired by Paul's imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They saw Paul suffering for preaching the gospel. And they were inspired by that. They're like, if Paul can do it, and is willing to suffer for it, then I can do it. And, and they did. So what is this? The um, Verse 14, they speak the word without fear. What, what is the word they were speaking? Well, it goes back to verse 12, the word gospel, the furtherance of the gospel. These two things are the same thing. When Paul was preaching the word... He was preaching the gospel. And so these believers, that because of Paul's imprisonment, are now going forth, they're preaching the word. And the word they're preaching is the gospel. It's the good news. It is the most important thing in this whole dialogue. So that whatever your motives, whoever, whatever they were doing it for, he was just glad that the real message was getting out there. So what is the real message? What is the gospel? Do you embrace the real gospel? Well, let's talk about it. First of all, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So without faith, without believing on the Lord, you cannot get saved. In fact, that's the gospel. The gospel, the good news is, that there is a message that if you hear it and believe it, you will be saved. Remember John 5, 24? Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It all goes back to hearing the good news, hearing the word. In Mark, the last chapter in, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus challenged his disciples. He said, go and preach the Gospel to every creature. And that's what they did. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to them, uh, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the, of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. So what is this message? It's the gospel. It's the good news. What is the good news? Paul summarized it in 1 Corinthians 15. He gave us what some have called the gospel in a nutshell. And it is probably the most concise, clearest articulation of what the gospel is. And because it's so concise, it also 
would by inference let us know what the gospel is not. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1 and following. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, and by which also ye are saved. Do you know that a person gets saved through the message of, of the gospel, according to Paul and Jesus and the New Testament. If you are saved, if you've had your sins forgiven, if your name is written in the book of life, it is because you heard the word of the gospel. Well, what is that? Paul articulates it. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So Paul's saying, What I'm preaching to you, I received it first, which is always convenient. If you're going to preach the gospel, the good news to other people, most people do that because they first heard the gospel and realized it was for them, and they got saved. And so here he says now, here's where he says what the gospel is. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also I received, how that the Baptist church would be formed and lead... Oh, am I not reading this right? How the Catholic... Oh, wait, wait a minute. How the Presbyterian... Oh, wait a minute. No religion. It's interesting. He doesn't mention any religion. He does mention a person. And a person is the focus of the gospel. You take away this person. You take away his finished work. You add to his finished work. You don't have the gospel anymore. Look what he said. Here's what I delivered unto you, first of all, which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen. And then it lists all the people that saw Him. That's the Gospel. That's it. Simple as pie. It's the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins according to the Word of God. It's what Paul believed, and it's what saved him. It's what they believed, and it's what saved them. And Paul would write this in Romans 1.16. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. If you ask, how do you get saved? How do you know you're going to heaven? The answer, the gospel. It's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He, he died for our sins, was buried, rose again. And that, and that alone is what saves the soul. Now, if you've heard that message and you have believed on that message, that's it. You are saved. Genuinely. If you've tried to add anything to that, if you're believing in Jesus plus the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the Presbyterian church, then you're not trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Or if you're trusting in Jesus and some of your good works and religious deeds, you're not trusting in Jesus. Those things are not mentioned. That's not the gospel. In fact, that's not good news. When you try to add your works to the gospel... That just went from great news to horrible news. Because if it was up to us, folks, no matter how many good works we could do, what's the Bible say? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are either saved by faith alone or we are not saved at all. So, it's all about what Jesus did on Calvary. You know, I've, I've recently re reinvestigated. Um, the majority of institutions of higher learning in America, the majority of them, like 98%, I think I, I read, the majority of them began as Bible schools training ministers or missionaries for the gospel. And I'm talking Ivy League schools, the big name schools, 
the schools that today have great prestige, they started as preachers of the gospel. And there's so many examples, I just want to give to you one. You ever heard of Princeton? Princeton is an Ivy League school, isn't it? It used to just be called the College of New Jersey. And then they got more highfalutin, I guess, and they became Princeton. And Princeton was uh, originally started to train uh, ministers in the Presbyterian Church. And um, the first century and a half, it it was started in 1746 by Presbyterians. And the first century and a half, up until 1902, every president of Princeton had been a preacher of the gospel. Princeton's most famous president was Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist. Um, the, uh, the first president, uh, in fact, their motto was, under, God, under God's power, she flourishes. You say, Princeton University was a Bible school? Is it now? Folks, not even their theological seminary is a Bible school anymore, you know. As I've said before, and I love this quote, that uh, you know the most spiritual thing in Princeton Seminary is their graveyard, the cemetery. Because that's where all the, the Bible believers that used to teach there, many of them are buried there and they died. And on their tombstones, there's more scripture and more Bible truth than in their liberal cemetery right now. Or in their uh, se- seminary, excuse me. But um, their very first president was a guy named Jonathan Dickinson. And there's a famous quote of his, and I want to read to you the original quote. It's, it's been a little twisted, but the truth is conveyed. Because this is what they stood for years ago. The gospel. And listen to what the first president of Princeton University now, what the first president said in a message that he preached in October of 1845, in glo- uh, no, I'm sorry, he published this in 1768. The school was founded in 1746. And the title of his message was Glorying in the Cross. Uh, Galatians 6.14 is what he was preaching on. Listen to what he said. He said, Mistake me not, my brethren. I am not speaking against learning in itself. It is a precious gift of God and may be happily improved in the service of the gospel. But I will venture to say, in the spirit of the Apostle Paul's writings in general, accursed be all that learning which sets itself in opposition to the cross of Christ. Accursed be all that learning which disguises or is ashamed of the cross of Christ. Accursed be all that learning which is not made subservient to the honor and glory of the cross of Christ. That was, they were preaching the gospel. Now the Bible says, because the, 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 the preaching of the cross separates people. The Bible, Paul would say this. He'd say, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved... It is a power of God. So people that are saved, they understand the good news is wrapped up in the cross and what Jesus did. People that are not saved, the cross is a bloody, horrible aspect of Christianity. That's the big difference. Now, let's, so the message, if you're going to preach the gospel... You have to focus on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone for your sins. And if you do that, you're preaching the gospel. And here's what's weird. When Paul was imprisoned, people became motivated to go out and preach the gospel, but they all weren't sincere. Right message, wrong motive. Look what he says in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. In other words, that was their motive. Let's talk about envy. Envy is a word which means uh, a grudge 
or a spite. You ever hear something, someone say, wow, they did that in spite. They, they, they were not pro that person. Whatever someone does in spite is usually done against someone. And then the word strife is a word which means contention, wrangling, uh, you know, strife, contention. It's, it's argumentative. Not just presenting arguments. It's being argumentative. And so there were people that went out, and, and folks, they did not preach the wrong message. Paul didn't say they were preaching like he will in Galatians or other places. He didn't say these people are going out and preaching another gospel, and there was another gospel. He wasn't saying there are people that are going out now in Rome because of my imprisonment, and they're now preaching another Christ. And there was another Christ. Different message. This is not that case. See, these were people, folks, that were preaching the right message. But they just had the wrong motives. Paul, in the book of Philippians, we'll talk about these later on, he talked about adversaries, opponents, and he's going to mention them later. He would say, beware of dogs, beware of the concision. And there were other places in Philippians where he would condemn people, he'd say, these people, and basically he was saying, they are not saved. Watch out for them. He's talking about what we call the Judaizers. You ever heard of that? The Judaizers were people that claimed to be preaching Christ. They would have told you tooth and nail. They, they're preaching the same message Paul was, but they were putting works into it. Nothing will corrupt the gospel quicker than adding human effort to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Understand that. When you have someone that claims they're preaching the same message and they mention the Jesus of the Bible and what He did on Calvary, but in some way they add their efforts. That's what Judaism did. The Judaizers, rather. The Judaizers said, yes, Jesus died on the cross. That was necessary. Absolutely. But we need to include circumcision. We need to include other works. You no longer have the gospel. And, and folks, Paul did clearly condemn the Judaizers. In fact, he said in, to the Galatians, he said, even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches another message unto you, don't listen to them is the bottom line. They're not preaching the gospel. This was not talking about those people. These were people that were identified as believers, brethren. And the message they were preaching was the gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for their sins. They just weren't doing it sincerely. Let's talk about that. When Paul preached the gospel, he was preaching sincerely. In fact, in Acts chapter... If, look, turn, turn to Acts chapter 20 for a minute. I want you to see this. In Acts chapter 20... Everybody remember where they put the book of Acts? Yeah, New Testament, right. Acts chapter 20. And I want you to look. Paul is now in Ephesus. And he is gathered with the elders of the church. Some multiple churches, pastors from the churches in Ephesus are gathered together. And now Paul is preaching to them. And he is reminding of, of them when, they, when he first went to Ephesus to preach the gospel. So Paul was preaching the gospel. What is that? Death, the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. And faith in that alone is what saves us. That's what Paul was preaching. But I want you to look at how he preached it. Look at verse 31. He said, therefore, watch and remember. He's talking back to the beginning when he first came to Ephesus. That by the space of three years, that's how long, how long he was in Ephesus. That's one of the long stays. I mean, he was in Thessalonica for weeks, maybe a few months at most. Other places he was there for months, maybe a year. He was in Ephesus for three years. And he said, remember that when I was there, I ceased not to warn everyone, 
night and day with tears. What was Paul crying about? Well, remember the gospel? What is the gospel? It is the message of the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, according to the scriptures, his burial, his resurrection, and faith in that alone. Why would Paul cry? There's an Old Testament concept that I believe motivated Paul, and it should motivate all of us. It was talked about mainly in the book of Ezekiel. Jeremiah also did this, but it's called the watchman on the wall. You see, God told Ezekiel, I am making you a watchman on the tower, and it's your job to protect the city. And he's using the watchman as an example. Let's say a watchman is standing guard on a city, up on the tower, on the walls of the city, and he sees an army coming, an army equipped for battle. What is a good watchman going to be doing? He's going to be playing solitaire, right? I don't think they had solitaire back then. He's going to be watching his favorite soap operas. No TV back then. What is a good watchman going to do? He's going to be alert. He's going to see the danger. And he's going to warn the people. And that's what Paul was supposed... In fact, that's how Paul saw himself. Because, folks, there is a danger coming to people. And that danger is the wrath of God who must punish sin. He will punish sin. And the only escape is that Jesus Christ came and took our sins upon Himself, died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. And now, all we need to do is put our faith in Him to respond and believe. Take Him as our substitute. He died for me. And when you and I do that, we are spared the judgment of God. But lest you think all people go to heaven, which is so many believe that, why would Paul be weeping? He's weeping because God told Jeremiah, if you see the judgment coming and you don't warn anyone and the enemy comes and kills all the people, their blood is going to be on your hand. If you warned everyone and they didn't do anything to defend themselves or get ready, then their blood is on their own hand. And now Paul saw that as an application to New Testament evangelism. You and I who are saved, by the way, if you're saved, why did you get saved? Because you understood you deserve judgment and wrath. You understood that you were a sinner worthy of judgment. Or you wouldn't have gotten saved. You also understood that the way to escape that was what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I right? If you, have, if you claim to be saved, that means you understood that the only way you're going to get, at, get, get into heaven is through the gospel, the good news. What Jesus did for you. Not what you do for God. It's what Jesus did for you. And then, now here's the, here's the thing. When you put two and two together, if that's how God saved you, isn't that how God saves other people? And it is. Here's what John said. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son, that would be Paul, has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Therein is your urgency. The people without Jesus Christ do not have life. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 3, the wrath of God presently abides on them. See, folks, there's a crisis going on. People are heading to hell because they've not had their sins forgiven. They've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God abides on them. And what the only way they can be saved is to hear the gospel. According to Romans chapter 10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that confesses with his mouth and believes in his heart that, that Christ has risen from the dead is saved. And then Paul says, How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? 
How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That urgency motivated Paul. He cared about people. And by the way, that is the sincere motive to witness to people. That's what Paul did. Why did Paul go into Ephesus and cry like a baby? <laughs> Why did he do that? Because he cared about these people. He loved them. And he knew if you don't get born again, if you don't receive Jesus Christ, you're not going to go to heaven, no matter what your religion is. That's what he believed. And he cried. He wept. And so he could say, in that text that we read, Acts 20, he could say, going back to that picture of Ezekiel, I am free from the blood of all men. And we need to be able to say that too. But folks, that is the good news. And the fact that people have preached it with the wrong motives. In fact, in his book, let me just read to you. Um, in his book called Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Macon, written many, many years ago, when liberalism and modernism first began to creep into the church and people started denying the cardinal doctrines of the faith, uh, and he, he writes this, and it's beautiful, because he turns to the text in Philippians chapter 1, because he's addressing liberalism. liberalism. Liberalism is all about feel good. It's about, about doing good. Jesus was a great man. He was a great example that we should follow. We should want to be like Jesus. But Jesus wasn't about condemning or anything like that. And, and we just want to follow his example and it has their own version of Christianity. And his point was that, you know what, Paul, first of all, in fact, let me just read to you part of what he said. He said, um, if any one fact is clear, it is that the Christian movement at its inception was not just a way of life in the modern sense, but a way of life founded upon a message. It was based not upon mere feeling, not upon a mere program of work, but a, upon an account of facts. Remember what I said, what the gospel is? Death of Christ for our sins, burial, resurrection, facts, history, message. He said, in other words, it was based upon doctrine. Certainly with regard to Paul himself, there should be no debate. Paul certainly was not indifferent to doctrine. On the contrary, doctrine was very, the very basis of his life. His devotion to doctrine did not, it is true, make him incapable of a magnificent tolerance. And here's what he goes on. He talks about the fact that if it was all about being accepted and feeling good and, and trying to learn about the love of Jesus and it wasn't about a message, then Paul would not have rejoiced at our text today about these people that were making his life more difficult. They would be enemy number one, wouldn't they? For whatever, whatever their result, whatever they did to do it. Because they made life harder for Paul, adding to his affliction, making things worse for him, they were preaching the gospel with insincere motives. Then Paul would be very much against them, just like he was against the Judaizers in Galatia, but he wasn't. Paul did not condemn these people. He wasn't thrilled. It wasn't making his life any easier. But what did he say at the end? Look at verse 18 of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. He said, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I then therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. The point is that very clearly. Paul, if, he was, if it was all about himself, and there were many preachers, many people rather, uh, in the church in Galatia, in the churches in Corinth, that were going around slandering the Apostle Paul. He's just sending for what he's getting out of it. He, he doesn't care about you. And if that was the case, if Paul was only interested in his own comfort, that he would not have rejoiced that the gospel was going forth from people that were not sincere. Now it's a shame. It is a shame that there would be people 
that don't genuinely care for souls, but have some other motive to preach the gospel, but it is a fact. And yet Paul could still rejoice because it wasn't about him. It was about fidelity, truthfulness to the message. I close with this. Many years ago I read this, this statement because I've read things very similar to this at other times. And that is that just because someone preaches the gospel doesn't even mean they're saved. Really? Yeah. Let me give you this example. And I'm just going to read it from the account of this author who, was, who knew this preacher. But again, I have heard this time and time again. And I want to read it to you. This man says, I remember a camp meeting we had one time. It was glorious. The pr and listen to the effectiveness of this preacher. Every preacher wants to be able to communicate the gospel so clearly, so simply, so understandably. And we don't always measure up because we're imperfect. We stumble, stutter, make mistakes, use the wrong words, go to the wrong verses, you know. But listen to what this man did. Listen to how this is explained. He says, the preacher that night was a pastor of a church of about 400. He preached on the cross. The gospel. His oratory took us to Gethsemane where we saw our sin being laid on the sinless Son of God. We followed Him to observe the beating that Jesus endured on our behalf. Then we saw the procession to Golgotha where we watched and listened as Jesus died for each one of us individually. But then the preacher's words led us to the tomb where we rejoiced in the glorious resurrection. And after about one and a half hours, everyone there knew that there was only one way to heaven and that the door was open that night. My 17-year-old brother was saved that week. I can still see him running out the meeting into the woods where he fell upon his face in the pine needles and prayed through. He came back into the meeting to join about 40 others who publicly testified of being saved that night. The next two hours were filled with testimonies, songs, and praise. That noisy crowd of Baptists would have made a Pentecostal feel like a Lutheran. I love that quote. That's a good quote. Now he said this. He said, now I'm not just reminiscing and telling you that story. Because about a year later, that pastor who preached that marvelous message that night, stood up before his church to confess that he had never really known God himself. He told how he became a preacher because he was gifted with words, but he never had peace with God. He hoped that preaching and leading others to Christ would give him peace, but it never had. That Baptist preacher testified of how he later spent two days alone seeking peace with God before he experienced simple childlike faith in the finished work of Christ. That's what salvation is. He who had preached so many into the kingdom had finally taken the step of repentance and faith in Christ he had preached for so long. Is that possible? Yes, it is. He had deceived himself and others for 15 years while he was having great success as a fervent preacher of the old-fashioned soul-saving gospel. You might, ask, you might be asking, how could people be saved under the ministry of an unsaved man? They did it when Paul's opponents, brothers that, that were not sincere, went around preaching the gospel to make things harder for Paul. How can that be true? The answer is clear from Scripture. It is not the man who saves anyone, the preacher. It is Christ alone. Just because a donkey carried God's message to Balaam, it did not add to or take away the power of God's message to that man. That's a good point. So God can use a donkey to communicate His message. 
He can use unsaved people, and he does. A Bible printed by a sinner is just as good as one printed by a saint. So, what's the takeaway? I want to challenge you today, first of all, have you embraced the true gospel? Death, burial, resurrection of Christ for your sins, and that alone is what you're trusting in. No extra fluff, not being a member of this church or any other church, not the ordinances or sacraments of another church. It is faith alone. Clearly contrasted in the Bible with works. One or the other. One nullifies the other. Have you embraced that? Today, would you say, I am trusting only in what Jesus Christ did for me. I am a sinner. I needed a Savior. I needed Jesus to do that for me. And I'm trusting that. Then number two, are you preaching that? Sincerely. Are you, you know, some people preach the gospel so they can brag about how many people they presented the gospel to or quote how many notches they got on their belt as far as how many professions were made and they bring it down to this very carnal thing that is not sincere because folks, why, do we, why are we supposed to preach the gospel? So we can see professions made and a hundred people baptized every month. No, it's, it's so people can escape judgment because we care about people. Let's not be like whoever these scoundrels were that were brothers in Christ, but were preaching the gospel insincerely. Let's be those that genuinely love others to the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help us as we think about this oddity of people that were preaching the true message with wrong motives, that they were doing it of envy and strife. They, they were doing it not because they cared about the souls of others, but by their doing it, it would make things harder on Paul. Help us to understand how that can happen. And Father, may that be used of us to make sure that we are embracing the genuine gospel. That we are not like that Baptist preacher who though we can articulate it, though we can communicate what the gospel is, We've never experienced saving faith ourselves, Father, help us to just get alone and get before you and be certain that our trust is in the true gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then, Father, help us to realize the implications that if that's what saves us, that's what saves everyone else. And Lord, if we are quiet and we're not sharing that, Shame on us. If we really believe, Father, we are watchmen, then help us to be warning others. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books out, please. Let's stand. And we are going to turn to hymn 298, uh, appropriate song for this message. There is power in the blood. Pay attention as you sing. Hymn 298. There's power in the blood. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4, 298, power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Verse 3. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. 
There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. On the last, would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Really His praise is to sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. You are dismissed.